Hello, everybody, and welcome to Spring with the Seasons Leadership Podcast, where we are awakening to new energy, creativity, and the opportunity to elevate our thinking. Throughout this season, we are going to continue to bring you actionable advice to inspire you to explore new possibilities, clarify your vision, and start your plan to improve your leadership in life today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Debbie Collard, and my co-host Susan Ireland is with us today as well. As certified leadership coaches and co-founders of Seasons Leadership, we share a vision to make excellent leadership the worldwide standard. This drives us to partner with individuals, teams, and organizations to increase and accelerate leadership excellence, which is a specific skill that helps leaders successfully achieve high levels of performance. You can learn more about this at seasonsleadership.com. You've experienced plenty, medi- plenty examples of mediocre leadership, maybe even bad leadership. So join us in making positive leadership the norm rather than the exception. By listening and engaging in the discussions featured on this podcast, you help us bring leadership excellence to the world. And today we are very excited to have a special guest, Mark LaRoost. Mark is a leadership and communication expert who is the best-selling author of the book, Glow in the Dark and the award-winning host of the Unconventionalist podcast, and whose mission is to help entrepreneurs and business leaders impact the world with their story. Mark's own purpose is to serve those who serve others. And he believes that being yourself is good for business. And we agree with that. His vision is to create a world where people feel a part of an exciting mission and feel seen, heard, and appreciated along the way. He's worked with pioneering organizations and forward-thinking leaders, including Google, TEDx, INSEAD, L'Oreal, and Virgin Startup, and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, and Forbes, just to name a few. His first book, It's Not You, It's Me, is a modus operandi for unfulfilled professionals looking to find more meaningful and entrepreneurial work. And his TEDx talk, What They Don't Tell You About Entrepreneurship, is the most watched TEDx card of talk to date. And there's a reason for that, by the way. (laughs) Mark's new book, Glow in the Dark, How Sharing Your Personal Story Can Transform Your Business and Change Your Life, officially came out worldwide on April 11th, 2023, and was recently shortlisted for a Business Book Awards. We will, of course, dive more into all of this about his book in our powerful conversation today. So join us as we delve into Mark's insights on helping leaders share their unique stories with the world to inspire those that they serve and lead. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. And, and actually, I've got a little scoop for you. This is the first podcast that I've recorded since since it's been announced. But um, Glow in the Dark has actually won the Best Self-Development Business Book of the Year Award at the Business Book Award 2023. So, Woo-hoo! yeah, Woo-hoo! it's Great super exciting. I know. So yeah. I, I, you're, you're getting the scoop. You're getting the first interview on the back of that victory. So I appreciate you having me. And it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Well, it's well, an we're honor. honored to have you on, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Mark, this is really an honor. And I really have listened to the, the, um, audio book because that came out here first and now mm. I've got the book and mm-hmm. it really struck a chord with me and um, boy we have a lot to talk about but first I want to ask you because Debbie and I are all about leadership excellence mm. and so you are a leader in in your field but what does leadership excellence mean to you? Mm. So what I love about that question is that there are two parts to it there is the leadership and then there's excellence. And I think to me, leadership is a word that can sometimes be misunderstood. Um, My perception of leadership, which I think we kind of share from the back and forth emails we've had and reading a bit of your content online, is actually, I don't believe that leadership is down to a job title or, or years of experience. It's actually more like an attitude and a mindset and that leaders take responsibility for their world. So It doesn't matter where you are on an organizational chart. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home dad or mom or, you know, whatever you're doing in life, there's an opportunity for you to show up in a powerful way and serve those around you. And and that's why I keep on saying like my, my, my purpose in life is to serve those who serve others. And I think ultimately that's why I believe we're all leaders. So I just wanted to say that to start off with. So leadership is not a job title. Um, The second thing is excellence. I think it's, it's kind of fulfilling your highest potential. And I think nothing comes closer than leadership to be your higher calling to fulfill that mission in your life, because you get to serve others, you get to help those around you 
be the best version of themselves. And so leadership excellence is this concept for me, at least the way that I interpret it, as you said, those words to like, how can I maximize my impact by living my fullest version of who I am while doing so and having a ripple effect with those around me and those I lead and serve. That's fantastic. I love that description. In fact, we might borrow some of your words and put it on <laughs> our website because I think it was a, a great down to earth description that people can really get their arms around. Um, mm. What we hear a lot of, from people is, well, I'm not a leader because they're equating mm. it with the job title or being a manager or being a certain level or being in a certain yeah. job. And, and that makes sense. And and, and by the way, mm -hmm. that makes sense because, you know, I, I do quite a lot of work in companies. I get invited to go and talk at Fortune 500s and nonprofits and business schools and that kind of stuff. And and I often say, you know, I wish I knew this when I was an employee for 10 years. Like, I think I had this archaic, outdated version of what leaders are. It's kind of like leaders at the top and everybody else, including me, is kind of at the bottom or middle ground or whatever it is. But actually, when you flip the switch on leadership and you kind of see yourself as a leader, no matter what your job title is, it changes your ability to influence and change the direction and course of your career or life or, or whatever it is, because suddenly you're no longer, I know, this, I know it's a strong word, but it's like, it's almost like you switch from being like a victim mindset to a kind of a hero mindset or heroine mindset. It's this idea that, oh, actually I can, I can make an influence. And, you know, I remember giving this conference and having a talk and it was, it was a room full of, um, uh, of assistants and, 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 and PAs and, and they kept on going like, well, you know, we're being told what to do. And I said, well, wait a minute, you know, think about all the different people you get to interact every day on the phone when you're making phone calls, emails, like every single interaction you have is an opportunity to make someone feel seen, heard and understood. Like what greater gift is that? And if that's not leadership, I don't know what is. So I just hope that everybody's listening to this. You can kind of go, oh, maybe leadership is not this outdated, archaic concept that we've been, you know, kind of told about. It's specifically in like business kind of textbooks and, and and business schools and that kind of stuff. Although lots of business schools are changing because I know I'm, I'm giving talks in some of them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope that I hope that helps to redefine that that concept. Well, yeah. I think I just want to add because I think it's a lot of it's unconscious because the structures mm -hmm. that we have in organizations is a lot of times hierarchical. And so mm -hmm. like we we unconsciously like understand what that means and fall into that without really mm. thinking. And so these conversations, I think, hopefully help us all realize, like, just because we might be in a certain structure doesn't mm. mean we have to behave like that. Mm. Like what we, you know, these old outdated kind of ideas um, that 100%. the world is different and we can be different, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So Mark, I would like to know from you, I would like to hear from you about your current thoughts and passions and um, working on this whole glow in the dark theory. Mm. Thank you for asking. Um, so I believe that if you knew how powerful your story was, you wouldn't be sitting on it. And I think that was kind of the premise of why I want to write the book glow in the dark. I, I had this kind of unique ringside seat between leaders and entrepreneurs and founders who who really wanted to find a way to capture the attention and imagination of their customers, their employees, their shareholders, but really struggled to kind of find a way to do it in an authentic way that felt congruent to their values and put themselves out there, out there in a way that didn't feel cringe or sleazy, or whatever it was. And the story that they made up about who they needed to become in order to be, and I put air quote here for people who are listening to this, successful. Meanwhile, I had a podcast that I launched in 2015 called The Unconventionalist, celebrating unconventional leadership and those who dared to go against the, the grain and, and aren't afraid to change the status quo and who are building movements that are literally changing the world. And I was sitting across these individuals and hundreds of these conversations, and I realized something fundamental, like there's really nothing that different from them than anybody else that I interact with, including myself. The only difference was that their ability to put their attention and focus on what matters versus on their limiting beliefs, inner critiques, saboteurs, whatever you want to call them. And I thought that was fascinating. And, and some guests I was interviewing, I would literally go, have you ever shared that story before? And they would say, no. And I'm like, that's, that's crazy. Like your story is really inspiring. It's amazing. It's fit in the blank. And over and over again, I'd get these individuals who just did not see the value of, of their story. And there's actually a, 
a word for that. There's a description. It's called proximity bias. I talk about it in the book. It's when you're so, when you're cl so close to something, you actually don't see its value, right? Um, and so the best metaphor I, I, I share with this, and I talk about this in the book, I kind of started doing some research and got really fascinated by the reasons and excuses that most leaders or individuals come up with as to why they're not sharing more of themselves in a public way, especially in a professional and business context, especially around their personal story or, or, or personal narratives, right? And so I came up with like these 10 different uh, story blockers. I'm not going to get into all of them. You can, you can check them out in the book, but I think some of the really common ones are things like, I just don't think my story is that interesting. Like I don't have a Hollywood background story. I didn't overcome, you know, big capital T trauma or even small T trauma. So I don't, I don't, I just don't see the point and interest. And so what I say to these individuals and people, and often when I talk about this on stage, I'll say, you know, think about, um, let's, let's go with you, Debbie. Okay. So what's, what's one of your favorite films, Debbie? An American president. An American president. Why do you love American president? Like, what was it about that film when you first saw it that made you feel something? Um, what made me feel something about that was uh, that he was real instead mm. of falling into the stereotype of what he was supposed to do mm -hmm. in that role as president. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember when you first saw it? Not the year, but I remember no, the feeling when I first saw it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And how many how many times would you say you've seen it since? Probably seven. Seven. I just watched cool. it again last week. <laughs> yeah. And and it's, it's that kind of film that if you're in a hotel, you're traveling, it comes on TV, you're just kind of like, I'm going to have to watch this now. Like, So seven times, it, it came up real quick. But here's the thing. Now, if I told you, look, I'm going to put you in a room with snacks and water, and you're going to have to watch that same film, not once, not twice, but a hundred and a thousand times back to back. How long do you think it would take you before you just lost the will to live and you were just like, oh, this is this story is just like not at all what I thought it was? Like how many not, how long do you think that would take you? Uh not very long, actually. Uh probably less than half a day. <laughs> yeah, I reckon after three, three times. So it's the same thing with your story. It's the same thing with all our stories. We live these stories over and over again to the point where we are just bored of them. We just think that they're uninterested, but nobody else has actually seen them yet. So you've got to think about people out there are like you for the first time when you saw that film, are just fascinated by that story, get intrigued, get hooked or whatever it is. And so we have to remove ourselves and almost remove that ego of thinking that we are the best judges to know if our story is relevant or not, because we're not, we're terrible. I can tell you this, now, working with CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs around the world, we are terrible judges at how inspiring a story is like nine times out of 10. So that's kind of like one example, right? So I came, I came fascinated with that topic. I started researching and then we got a book deal with Hachette UK, which is kind of one of the major publishers in the world. Um, and, uh, and I went to work and it took me three and a half years um, to write this book because I really, really believed in its message, which, you know, that everyone has a story worth sharing that, your greatest gift that you have is sharing your story because it's unique, which by the way, I, I haven't written, I'm going to write this in a newsletter. So I haven't, I haven't shared it yet. It's coming out next week, I think, but I just took my kids to celebrate the award. Um, my partner, we took the kids, we went up to a, a weekend outside of Bath in the UK. There's like this kind of, and I put again, air quote safari. I used to live in South Africa. So I know what a <laughs> real kind of safari is, <laughs> but um, I went to the safari and we take the kids out and it's great. And they're loving it. You know, we're seeing monkeys, they're climbing the car and all that stuff. And then we go to like this enclosure, there's like a zebra sign, right? And, and it says on the sign, it says, did you know, like, you know, one of these kind of fun facts. And did you know that every zebra is different? There's not a single similar pattern of stripes in any given zebra. They're all unique. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful metaphor that is for our stories, right? Like if you look at a Z, like a herd of zebras, I don't know if it's herd, but I'm going to use the word herd. If you see a herd of zebras, you'd be like, they kind of look the same. Like they don't look that different. <laughs> And yet they're all unique. And it's the same thing with our stories. Nobody's got your life experience. Nobody's got that worldview that you have. And in fact, I would argue you'd, 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 be, you'd be, you know, tough to find a more unique skill that we possess as leaders than our unique stories, because everything else can be copied. We can copy your product, your services, even your techniques, methodologies, and frameworks, but we cannot, absolutely cannot replicate or duplicate your story. In fact, you know, a lot of the conversation at the moment is chat GDP, AI, and all this kind of stuff. And I think that's going to be great. And we're going to be, become human, you know, powered by AI. But one thing that AI can't do is, is emotion, at least yet, right? They can't do empathy. They can't do triggering emotions. And 
creativity is like on, 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 you know, debatable. That's what you possess as a leader. So I had that. And then the last bit I want to answer is I kept on hearing this, this, this kind of misconception, a bit like what we talked about leadership at the start, this misconception again about, oh, okay, Mark, I get why story matters. You know, it's the native tongue and we've been doing it for you know thousands of years and all this kind of stuff. But I, I, I just don't see how like I could put myself out there because I look at my Instagram or my tick, what are my kids on TikTok, whatever it is. And I don't want to be like dancing and sharing pictures of my <laughs> avocado toast. Like I, I, that just sounds weird. And I'm like, yeah, that, that could be weird unless you're like a health, you know, kind of well being leader in your, in your field. But the point was they kept on coming up with these stories and excuses. And what I realized was that, oh, most kind of what I would call impact driven leaders who genuinely care about the work they do, the products and services they put out in the world, want to see their clients or customers get the results to win in life or in business, don't want to come across as the kind of person who wants to be the center of attention and doesn't necessarily like to be the center of attention, which is kind of ironic, right? But, and so I had to kind of wrap my mind around this and I realized I was like, oh, actually sharing your story isn't about you being in the spotlight. It's about you becoming the spotlight. Right. And by sharing your story, you shine a light on a message, on a cause, on an issue, on something, the movement that is important to you. And so you become a vehicle for that. And when people can adopt that mindset shift, it really helps because it certainly becomes, oh, you're telling me it's not about me. And I'm like, no, your story is about you, but it's not for you. Right. Like it's a really important distinction. Your story is about you, but it's not for you. And so when you use your story and, and, and leverage it, to have a bigger impact to those you lead and you serve, you suddenly realize it's like, oh my God, this is like, I've got a superpower. And that's that's kind of why I wrote the book. I, I, the first, the book is divided into two sections. The first book is very much around, let me get your brain on the side of saying like, yeah, storytelling matters, personal story and personal driven narrative story really matters for marketing and blah, blah, blah. I'm in, how do I do it? Section two of the book is how to. So I, I have a formula that I developed the three S's of impact-driven storytelling, which is source, shape, and share. Happy to talk about that, you know, if that's easy. But effectively, that's what I did. And, and uh, the book came out and and it's been a wild, wild ride because I was literally like in my man cave for three and a half years, you know, just like fighting all the self-doubt, which ironically I was talking about in my book. So very aware, very aware, well, aware of it. <laughs> you know, fighting off the self-doubt getting this book out there. And now it's just, it's just weird. It's taken a life of its own. You know, you know, the award came through, you know, we, we, we became an Amazon uh, bestseller in three different categories when we launched on, on publication day. I've just been flown out to California to go and give a talk and it's wild. <laughs> it's, I'm not because it's just, it's, it's a bit wild, but at the same time, I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of the work that I've poured into this book because the first book I wrote, I, you'll never hear me talk about it or promote it even when I first wrote it, because it's it's a, it's a it's an okay book, but it's very much a tick box exercise. It was more like write a book to to get coaching clients, and that's kind of what I did. This is, it's like I poured my heart and soul into this, and I and I can stand by it, you know, pr pride. And actually, I know, and I'll, and I'll be quiet, and I'll stop with this. But when I was at the awards night, there was two hundred and fifty people in the audience. I was there with my partner Julie, and I was pretty much convinced I wasn't going to win, just for for multiple reasons, and. I, I said, whether I win or not, it's irrelevant. It doesn't really matter because I think this book is amazing. And I know it sounds really cocky, or, but it's, it's like a quiet confidence in the ability of this book to change people's lives because I've seen it. I've had, I've had too many DMs, messages, emails, almost like unshakable evidence that people reading this book have, have implemented stuff and changed their business and lives that I'm going, okay, it's, it's now doing its work. And and the weirdest thing is that I used, to, I used to have this thing about death, about fearing death and, and being obsessed about like, oh, if, what if my time comes too quickly and I don't have time to do everything I want? And since this book's come out, since the book's, when I've eased into it, knowing that that will live on long after I'm gone. My kids, when they're grown up, will be able to read that book. And actually, I don't know if you remember when you, when you read the, the book or heard it, but I, the, the very first sentence, I think it's like to Louis and Sophie, you know, may you continue to live lives worth sharing or something like that. Um, anyway, that's a really long answer to it, but hopefully that makes sense. I love that answer. And I have a follow-up question for you. So when you were in your three and a half years of, of creating this book, 
mm. and going through all the self-doubt, mm. which again, you talk about in the book. How did you keep yourself going? How did you keep motivated? So Dr. Valerie Young, author of The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, who I, I think she's putting this quote on the front cover now, but I basically said she is to imposter syndrome what Bernie Brown is to vulnerability. Um, and she's been doing it for decades, right? Studied it. And she said it best. She said that what she realized is that feelings are the last things to change. And I really want to pause there for a second and really land this because it's been a game changer for me to understand viscerally what that means. It's the same thing with I've, you know, I don't know if, if this is just an audio or a video as well, but for those of you who are uh, watching this, if you get to watch no. this, yeah. Like go back and watch some other videos of me online and you're like, is that the same mark? Cause I've lost <laughs> 12 kilos in six months. I don't know what that is in pounds. It's just, you know, it's, it's like, do you know, you know, water bottles, it's about like uh one and a half, it's like a pack of water. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, a whole pack of water, like worth of weight. So I lost that in six months. And it's very similar. It's it's this idea that whether I liked it or not, whether I felt like it or not, I just sat my ass in the chair and just typed. And I, I'm telling you, there are days that I'm sitting from my screen and I'm literally typing, I hate this, I hate every minute of this, but I'm just <laughs> typing and typing and typing. Any words um, would be better than no words. And and that's that's... It like I actually, you know, okay, so there's that. And the second thing is, um, I can show it to you now just to show that I'm not lying. I talk about there's the book, you know, if 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 you remember, Susan, I think I talked, you probably heard me about the like, audience of one, if that rings yes, a bell. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So audience of one is something I teach and talk about in the book, but I did it. So this is this is Donna. I talk about her in the book. Um, this is me with her when she just yes. wrote her book called Win, a best-selling book. So Donna O'Toole is an incredible leader. She is a phenomenal human with like just a super awe-inspiring story. I got to work with her um, on her story and I talk about her quite a bit in the book. And uh, and I would have her on my desk. And every time I would want to give up, every time I was like, screw this, I would look at that picture and I kind of go, but what if, what if there are other donors out there? What if there's someone else who just needs to hear this to not feel alone? Because I say this, I say, sharing a story has the ability to change the trajectory of someone's life so that they have a sense of hope about their future. And so I just had to, to do what I was preaching, which as parents, you know, is really hard. It's like, do what I say, not what I you know do. <laughs> but so I did it. And, and, um, and there's no secret. I know it, I know it sounds, it's really boring. Like my mom has been trying to write a novel for like four years or six years, or whatever it is. And she goes like, I'm so inspired by like how you're able to write like books. And I get, I get the sentiment why people would say that it's the same thing with my fitness journey. I've had guys and dads kind of had chats and like, Oh my, you know, you, you're so committed. It's like, but it's, it's not, it's kind of like, you just show up regardless. Like I, I go to the gym sometimes and I literally show up and I'm like, I don't want to be here. I do not want to be here. I oh, I would be anywhere but here. And I'll do the bare minimum. You know, I'll get on the treadmill and I'll sulk for like 20 minutes and I'll leave, but I'll, at least I showed up. And I think the more wins you can get under your belt, the more confidence you start building. And again, what's, you know, what Dr. Barry Young said, like your feelings are the last thing to change. And it's so true. I, I'll say something, which obviously I haven't said anywhere else because this is the first podcast I've done since I've, won the award but when i won the award um on tuesday so when they said my name i'll be honest the first thing that happened is like i kind of blacked out it was all it's all a bit of a blur i remember getting on stage i took a selfie because i'm like that i'm super cheeky um <laughs> and then you get on a kind of a conveyor belt right like you come off to take pictures and you go and do media interviews and you do all this kind of stuff so it's kind of like pop, 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 pop. it comes out everywhere and then you do group photos with the other winners and and i got home it was just all a kind of a I just couldn't believe it. The whole way home, I was driving home with you. I was just like, that's insane. We did it. We, we, we got, we won, we, we did it. And I, the next day I cried pretty much the whole day. Like I'm not joking. Now, it wasn't tears of, of sadness or like it was, it was tears of release. Yeah. And, and I'm going to write about this. And the subject line is going to be the shower of love that almost drowned me. And, and it's because the amount of love I got from people, from 
readers, from my community, from my friends, family, social media, just like it was so much to take in. And, and you got to think about the three and a half years of, of a battle because there's, there's a great book. It's very controversial. Some people don't like it. Um, I picked it out because it's here on my desk. There's a, there's a book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art, Break Through the Blocks and Win Your Inner Creative Battles. I cannot recommend this book enough because this really helped me. It basically just simplifies this concept of resistance and how resistance shows up in very sneaky way. So if you're tired, you want to watch Netflix or whatever it is, that's resistance. You know, So resistance just shows up in many different ways. And so take the three and a half years of struggle, but then you add to that over three decades of feeling inadequate because... As a kid, you know, I'm dyslexic with ADD. And so as a kid, I was bullied almost on a daily, if not weekly basis, but not by my peers, but by my school teachers, because I couldn't spell and I couldn't read out loud, let alone do simple maths. And so I was brought up in a, in a very archaic French education system, which if you couldn't confine to the conveyor belt, you, you really were kind of cast away as like the village idiot. And so I was held back a year which in France, again, is a huge stigma. Like all your friends move on, you stay behind. So you, I just felt stupid. And then when I was 16, 17, I was kicked out of conventional education and went on this kind of different path. And people in my class were like drug dealers and house robbers. And, and so I had all this baggage, if you want, over the years of just feeling like I'm not worthy of love and I'm not enough and like fill in the blank, right? And so on that night of the award, what happened is it's, a, it's weird to talk about it now because I still haven't really processed it. But on the Tuesday, I was walking, like I went to the gym and I remember just minutes before I got to the gym, just breaking into tears. Well, like Judy called me at some point in the day and I'm breaking into, I'm crying just randomly because it's tears of release yes. of just, we've done it. You know, like, like I, I, it's hard. And I know it's people who listen to this, like, get over yourself. It's just, you know, just wrote a book. But it was really that kind of that six-year-old Mark that I talk about in the book, yeah. right? Who was kind of traumatized by just how vicious school teachers were towards me, almost kind of smiling, going like, we did okay. You know, we 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 did okay. And and for that, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity to have, and you can see it there. I'm just gonna move uh it's where is it? It's there. You can't really see it's a shiny thing. I can show it to you at the end if you're interested, but the award's there now. And so that's undeniable proof that I am not as thick as I thought I was, or I'm not as stupid as I was led to believe I am. Although intelligence has nothing to do with your ability to write a book or not. It's the persistence, it's the discipline, and it's the constant pushback on the outside world and inner world trying to stop me on my tracks and and we won a little victory. We didn't win. We didn't win the war, but we won a little victory. So, anyway, that was that was like the 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 outcome of of the awards on Tuesday. Oh my God! You know, I loved you when I listened and read your book. Hearing you talk, I love you even more. <laughs> I, I think. Thank you. I think because. Uh, what you're describing you're like a regular person you're like me I can relate to mm. you so if you can do it I can do it too yeah and that's that was the message of the book that I tried to say yeah. guys you know that literally like the, the hundreds of people I interviewed in my podcast and I've interviewed some big names you know um and every time I kept on thinking are oh, they no different the only thing they've managed to do is to is to not necessarily make that voice wrong. Okay, there are exceptions. There are exceptions that generally are wired differently, and they don't see failure or fear as 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 like an option or like that. There are few exceptions, but those are far and few in between. I uh, see so the vast majority of people they they have those doubts, like especially that you know I work with CEOs and executives, and so I get to have an intimate conversation with them about themselves, how they see themselves, and how they think the world sees them, and. And we're all struggling with some stuff, right? <laughs> and so I think one of my secret visions is that, is this idea that like, if we could just all own our stories, be a bit more vulnerable, be a bit more authentic when we share our stories, I think we would feel a little less alone. And it's, and I talk about this in the book, um, <laughs> a few years ago, like almost not, yeah, six, seven, eight years ago, 
I get an email saying like, congratulations, you've been listed as like one of the top 50 most inspiring people in London <laughs> from like this city of London's initiative thing, uh, inspired 50 network thing. And I was like, this is a mistake or this is a scam. <laughs> like surely like there's just, <laughs> what, why? And I replied saying like, sorry, that must be a mistake. And, uh, but thank you, really <laughs> appreciate it. And they were like, what? No, 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 definitely, you know. <laughs> And so they send me a ticket, like an invite. If you want to bring guests, you can to like the celebration. And it's a true story. I invited as many people as I could, like my friends, my family, because I thought that if I come with an entourage, I'll let, I'll, I'll, I'll look less, I'll look less like a loser if they come out and they basically go like, oh, that's really <laughs> awkward. Um, yeah, it was another mark, like Le Bruce, you know, we just got, we just got the typo confused. And I, I get there, right? And like, I see all these other people on the screen and they're doing this amazing thing. And we're all, we're all in the space of kind of like fearless fundraising kind of stuff. And, uh, and I started chatting to other nominees, I think is the word is when you've been listed on a, li on, on a thing, right? And they're all, <laughs> and you know, maybe a couple of thin feel like that, but most of them were like, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, <laughs> and I was like, me too. And actually... It was in that moment that I realized like, oh, wait a minute. It doesn't matter how outwardly successful we are. If our internal mechanism can't catch up with our ability of greatness and impact, we're always going to feel less than. And, and again, you know, Barry Young said the best. She says, nobody wins when, when talented people play small. Yeah. And, and so that was actually the genesis of the Unconventionalist podcast. That night is when I realized we need to have more of these open conversations, fly on the wall moments where we get to hear two human beings who on the outside look, and I would put air quote again, successful, have a big following impact movement, brands, companies, whatever you want. And they're just full and riddled with doubt, just like you are. The only difference is what I found and, and kind of come to comprehend is that it's not about making them wrong per se. It's about going, they're probably never going to go away. I can quiet down. I can just turn the volume down. Or my partner hates like very loud environments. She's very sensitive to noise and light. And so she got targeted on Instagram to get these kind of little air birds that you can put. And it kind of just diminishes the sound when the kids are screaming and stuff around. And it's almost like that. I think that's a brilliant metaphor for like, well, you just, just tune down a little bit that voice because it's going to be around. And the louder it gets, the more of a sign it is that you're going in the right direction. You know, in fact, I'd be concerned and worried if you haven't got a single ounce of doubt or fear that creeps up in any place. It probably means you're not stretching enough. It probably means that you're right. not really, you know, and, and I heard this someone's like, you know, make your vision bigger than the voice inside your head. And and, oh, and that, that, yeah, that that kind of really helped me, mm -hmm. um, you know, keep going. And again, because I knew my book served a higher purpose than just just my name on the front cover. You know, like I knew that if if this was the book, you know, I wish we had two hours, but the short version is originally it was a very different book. I was I was right. When, when I sold the book, actually, to the publisher, it was supposed to be a book about how to help entrepreneurs overcome imposter syndrome. And as much as I love that concept, and it's actually I talk a lot about that in the book, mm -hmm. it didn't feel like that was the premise of the message I wanted to land. And so I actually had to go back to my publisher and said, I don't want to write this book, but the book I really want to write about is how you know, people with influence all have a story and, and a story not shared does not serve and and all this kind of stuff. Like, right, there's a story inside of all of us waiting to be told. And they trusted me, like to their on their credit, they trusted me. And um and I went and I went back to, to the drawing board and, and wrote this book. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> oh, we are too. We are definitely glad that you did. <laughs> Um, we could probably talk about this for way over two hours and I, and I wouldn't mm. be bored. I would be very engaged, but we have limited time today. Unfortunately, mm. Mark, we would love to invite you to come back again on seasons mm. leadership podcast, but I'd like to ask you one final question mm. uh, before we close out uh, this podcast episode today. And that is um, what is one thing you would like our listeners to know uh, today? What do you want to leave them with? Oh, uh. Okay, dear listener, <laughs> if you're listening or watching this, this is what I want you to know. Um, the story that will change your life is, isn't the one that you'll, you'll hear or read. It's the one that you share. Um, and I really, really hope that if you take anything from what I say today, and even if you don't buy or read my book or someone shares my book with you, I just hope that you understand that you have this thing 
that you've taken for granted and you've neglected for too long. And that's your story. That's your gift. And, you know, Roald Dahl said that we all have inside of us a gift that can change the world. And I really believe that that gift is your story because I'll, I'll close, I'll close with this. Um, I talk about this book. I haven't really talked about this publicly, but so of course, you know, I, I wrote my book in the, in the context of like for business leaders and owners and founders, all this stuff. But really I, I actually said to my friend, Emily Gindelsberger, the author of um, please help me love me. Um, that my Trojan horse of my book was healing. And she was like, you need to make that the central premise of your book, not the Trojan horse. And it's a hard sell when you go into like leadership context or community, you know, as you probably know, like if I say, Hey, we're going to talk about how to heal. Uh, they're like, is this therapy? Because it sounds creepy. And I go, so actually, <laughs> you know, I kind of lead with why every leader needs to learn how to connect on an emotional level with their audience if you want to win in, in the AI kind of powered world with this stuff. But I want to share a story that for me captures why I wanted to write this book. So about a year ago, my mom came to visit and we sat down and I've known quite a lot of stories about my mom, but of course, there's always this fear that my parents will go before I have time to really unpack their entire story. So I just asked her, like, tell me a bit more about your story, about you and dad, like how you met and, you know, just walk me back through that. And so she told the story. And without going to specifics, just to, just, just, just in, in respect of my mom's privacy, my mom had some pretty traumatic, you know, kind of upbringing and, um, and her entire life, she was led to believe that this thing that had happened in their family was her fault. And she hadn't told anyone about this, right? Like she had so much shame, so much fear, so much stigma around it. She hadn't told anyone, I think maybe one person, like her best friend or her cousin, but that's it. So when she decided to move in with my dad, um, leaving her native, you know, Welsh landscape and, and British countryside to come and go and live in suburban Paris, um, she realized that if I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this man, like I'm going to have to share him this, this secret that I've been so afraid of and 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 deeply ashamed of and so she told him she told him this this secret and uh and my dad said it's not your fault they had no right to make you believe that it was your fault it is not your fault and that was the first time my mom realized that actually it wasn't a fault and she was 20 i want to say 24 23, 24. So she lived for, you know, over 12 years of her life carrying this guilt because it was passed on to her. And so the gift of sharing that story with my dad enabled her to heal in some way. And I think I've seen this over and over and over again, where people think that their story, they haven't, parts of their story are too shameful, too guiltful, too fill in the blank that they fear to be rejected, but what I've found over and over again is that instead of getting rejection, what you find is connection. And it's the scariest leap you'll ever do. I mean, I know that. What I'm asking is, for some people, it's I'm asking you to jump in the fire. I'm asking you to jump in uh, a sea full of sharks, you know, because that's how it feels. But Obviously, I, in my book, I talk about ways of how to do that in a really conscious way and, and in a way that's going to serve you and make sure you're protected and, and you, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because obviously, there are stories that I call open wound stories that are best served in a very specific context, whether that's therapy or, or, or a professional or whatever. But over and over and over again, after having worked with clients, including myself, by the way, because if you remember how I opened up the book, I talk about how I'm standing in front of this room of journalists and potential fundraisers. I'm just about to launch Movember mm -hmm. Foundation in France. And I'm talking with passion about like why, you know, men's health and all this stuff. And at the end of my presentation, the journalist in, in the room raises her hand and she goes, that's great. But why did you quit your job to start this in France? And I remember just having this moment where I'm like, I've got two choices here. I can just come up with like some quick witty answer. I can speak the truth that I was that I went through a really tough time in 2009 that I went through some form of depression that I was so bad that I struggled to get out of bed that um I didn't want to see anybody I'm super social and extrovert and I just didn't want to hang out with anybody um and that I had told my mom at that time that I think I'm going through depression bless us bless her heart she was doing this from a place of real care and fear she said 
don't tell anyone that you're depressed, not even your best friend, not, not even Dennis, who's my best friend. I was like, why? It's like, because no one will ever employ you again. And she read the book, by the way, and she read that sentence. She's like, I'm so sorry I said that. I, I hope you know that it came from a good place. I was like, I know, I know, I, 100%. So I'm standing there in this room and I basically just went, well, that's, that's what's the worst that can happen. I can either continue to live a, a life of lie and fear and where I can bite the bullet and, and give it a go. And so I shared my story. I said, I really struggled. I said that November, the way that they talked about men's health was really inspiring for me. It was different. It, it was uplifting. It was aspirational. It was fun. It felt like a community, like I really, and of course my heart was racing and I had all these thoughts about this is going to be on the headlines, national headlines tomorrow. Like <laughs> country manager is actually depressed, <laughs> run away, you know? And I thought the earth was going to open up and the opposite happened. This, this guy called Matthew came up to me at the end and he said, I came here because I saw this event on Facebook and I wasn't quite sure if I was going to take part or not, but that really inspired me. It's the first time I saw another man or, you know, the other guy openly talk about the mental health issues. This is 2012, by the way. So it was a different story then than it is now. And uh, he said, but I'm, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to make sure I get loads of people to take part. And over the four years, I used my personal story linked to the mission of the organization more times than I'm comfortable to admit here. And we managed to raise 2.8 million euros for men's health and got 110,000 people to sign up. And I won a bunch of awards along the way for it. So take what you want of that story, but there is light, love, and hope and connection on the other side of shame. Wow. Wow. That, this has been such a powerful session on the podcast. And um, uh, like Susan, I'm feeling nothing but love and gratitude for uh, getting to have this conversation with you today, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for creating the space and having me. I, I really appreciate it. It was a genuine pleasure. But before we close, we want to see the award. Ah, oh yeah, okay. yeah go give, get it. Give me, give me a second. <laughs> All right. So for those of you listening to this, you're going to have to go and watch this on the uh, on the on the on the video YouTube channel. So, da da. I don't know if you can see it. It yeah. says uh, "Business Self Development Book 2023," and it's actually it's a book. So the award is it's kind of like a oh, very cool. See. Yeah, it's a book. It's very cool. Um, very congratulations. Thank yes, you very much. I think my uh, my six year old six year old Mark is very very uh, giddy and happy about it. So yeah, and and <laughs> and and the thirty nine year old version as well. So you know, version is very happy. <laughs> All versions very happy about yes. this one. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, listeners, thank you for joining us for the Seasons Leadership Podcast today. We hope you take these words of excellence that we've heard today with you to help strengthen your leadership and the organizations and communities in which you live and work. Join us in making excellent leadership the worldwide standard by subscribing to our community on Patreon. And remember that no matter what level or role you are, or what age, or what your story is, you can become more than you are today. Visit Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash seasons leadership to become a member and begin working towards your full leadership potential. We'd love to connect with you as we build our community of excellent leaders. Until next time, we are sending you positive vibes for new energy, creativity, and opportunity to elevate your thinking during this season of spring. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>